So I've called this talk, The Return of the Sacred Grace or Apocalypse. And I'll be looking at apocalyptic scenarios first and then moving more optimistically onto the idea of grace. And it, it seems to me that both are possible and indeed, ironically, we might be headed for a world where actually both happen um, in, in, a, in a peculiar fashion. And I'll be talking later about Pope Francis's statement which was released uh, just after the, uh, the Paris uh, terrorism incidents of last week and uh, what he has to say is extremely interesting. Um, but I only got that on the plane so this is not, a lot of this isn't uh, worked up and put in neat overheads and so on. Now um, I've been very influenced by uh, a French philosopher who, who many people will groan when they hear his name, Jacques Derrida. Uh. Groan? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, he has some very remarkable things to say about religion in the modern world. He's uh, somebody who's probably better known for postmodern nihilism, but in fact he had a religious experience um, 15 years before he died. And ironically enough, a lot of his fans never caught up with it. <laughs> so when you talk about Derrida to most academics, they know the Derrida before the religious experience but not after. That's rather convenient, isn't it? Yeah. Because it suits their uh, opinions and world views. Um, but naturally, with my disposition, I've read most of his books after 1988, which uh, was the year where he had a religious experience. Um, <coughs> he says in an essay called Faith and Knowledge, two sources of religion at the limits of reason alone. Those of you who have read philosophy will know that what sparked off this um, essay was uh, a, a marvellous piece of work by Immanuel Levinas, the great moral, Jewish moral philosopher, called God and Philosophy, where he threw the gauntlet down to philosophy and said philosophy has for too long considered that God is either dead or irrelevant or of another order of being. And um, Levinas said, no, this is not the case. Uh, he thinks that God is very real and with us, God with us. Indeed, his very name, Emmanuel, literally means uh, God with us, of Levinas. And Levinas uh, wrote to Derrida and said, uh, what, did, what did he have to say in reply? And Derrida said, Whatever one takes, whatever side one takes in this debate about the return of the religious, one must still respond and without waiting, without waiting too long. And there's a, uh, an Italian philosopher, Romano Guardini, who said this, modern man sought for answers within his soul. Enigmatic powers awoke out of the religious spirit. The force of the numinous, as that word again, impinged itself directly upon the human spirit, either from within the spirit or from the world at large. Not only was the numinous beneficent, but also bewildering, even destructive in its impact. That's from his book, um, very early book actually, 1957, The End of the Modern World. So um, I, th I think about uh, looking at the two faces of the return of the sacred. The return of the sacred as grace and the return of the sacred as a disorientation and indeed violence. Now the West has spread a what you might call a pseudo or false enlightenment uh, and many people now are calling it endarkenment as a sort of parody of what the West has given to the world. Of course, the West has given the world enormous gifts, technology, science. These things cannot be belittled. They have changed and revolutionized the way we live. But there's been a cost, which is the more information and knowledge we seem to have developed, 
the less wisdom we seem to have accumulated. So we've increased in knowledge and data and decreased in wisdom. Um, some cultures have resisted the West's enlightenment, but many have succumbed. And the religious impulse, many saying, is about to strike back with force. I'm thinking of this novel by Christopher Koch, The Year of Living Dangerously. The spirit doesn't die, of course, it turns into a monster, which was made into a, a major motion picture some years ago, The Year of Living Dangerously. Now it seems that the spirit behaves like any psychological organ when it is denied and mistreated. In favourable conditions it brings out the best in humanity and culture, but when it's suppressed it turns into a demonic power, threatening psychological and social stability. Now those of you who of course um, know, as most of you do, the, the so-called Old Testament, I don't call it that myself, but the Jewish Bible, you'll notice that of course God is frequently violent and frequently hitting out at people and uh, God's wrath and God's threatening of, um, of, of uh, uh, peace and uh, threatening of social stability. And we, in, those of us in Christianity, seem to think that we've kind of outgrown that to some extent and that our concept of God is a God of love. But um, it, it could be said that um, this old notion that uh, what is denied and what is suppressed hits back with a force does make us think again about the so-called Old Testament and perhaps it's not so old after all. Now it may not be that God is violent and I think it'd be wrong to say that. The jihadists say that. The jihadists have, a, have us believe that God is violent and that to kill people um, is something that elevates them into some sort of higher state and uh, martyrdom and uh, a life uh, in heaven with God, but what we can say, I think, is that when we live in denial of the life force that brought us into um, existence and continues to sustain us, the consequences can be dire. Again, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida wrote of the return of the religious and defined this as the coming of the other where the other is a term for everything that's different from the ego. The explosive force of the religion, that's a phrase he actually used, can interrupt history and tear history apart. In this interruption to the ordinary course of history, we have to be prepared for the best as for the worst, the one never coming without the possibility of the other, he says. Now, Derrida had predicted uh, that religion would return with violence because it had been suppressed with violence. And he spoke of religion rising like a tumour in society um, because so much had been ignored about our relation to ultimate reality. And energic pressure builds up in the soul which is liable to explode at, at any point. And he says this, Religious resurgence imposes itself upon us to suggest the redoubling of a wave that appropriates even that to which, enfolding itself, it seems to be opposed. It gets carried away, sometimes in terror and terrorism. This is, he wrote this before uh, the 9-11 uh, catastrophe. Allying itself with the enemy, hospitable to the antigens, bearing away the other with itself, this resurgence grows and swells with the power of the adversary. So it's very strange that this philosopher associated with, as I said before, postmodern nihilism became prophetic at the end of his life and warned about oncoming dangers to do with the return of the religious and the rise of, of terrorism. How strange, he said, to find the return of the religious not without relation to the return of radical evil. An astonishing comment to make. 
Now, 50 or 60 years before Derrida made these remarks, the depth psychologist Carl Jung, Swiss psychiatrist based in Zurich, um, claimed that modernity encourages us to live in the narrow confines of the ego. He means the ego as the personal self. And that the soul, or psyche, psyche is a Greek word which he translated as soul, excluded and ignored, arraigns itself against us, quote, as something which thwarts our will, which is strange and even hostile to us, and which is incompatible with our conscious standpoint. He said, the soul wants something different from the ego, and we are at war with ourselves. And he claimed, again in a, in a prophetic vein, that when an inner situation is not made conscious, it happens outside as fate. To what extent then is the scourge of terrorism an externalization of an internal conflict within, as it were, the world soul? What was called in the medieval times the anima mundi, soul of the world. So the world must perforce act out an inner conflict and be torn into opposing halves. <coughs> By the way, uh, Margaret um, Fairweather, where is Margaret, is she here? No. Um, she asked me, could I please, and I will of course, send her copies of these overheads because I realise you're not going to be able to write all this down and she will somehow make them available to you uh, post-conference. All of these, all, all five talks. David, we'll put them on the app. Put them on the app? We have an app for this summit. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. Now, this is something I've hit on recently, and I find it fascinating. But, like a lot of us, those of us who are Christians, I don't have a great knowledge of Islam. I know, I think you had a conference this Recently, the John Main Seminar was on that, wasn't it? In Chicago. I wish I had been there. According to Sufi texts, the notion of a holy war applies more to the inner than the outer realm. This should be of interest to meditators. The true meaning of jihad, according to Hazrat Inyat Khan, refers to the psychological strife to overcome the false ego, end quote. And when returning from battle against the so-called infidels, which is usually us, <laughs> the prophet Muhammad said, quote, we have come back from the lesser holy war to the greater holy war. And his companions asked, what is the greater holy war? And Muhammad replied, the war against the ego war against the ego. And when I read that and digested that, it occurred to me why there's such um, energy around jihad. Because it seems to be, according to the sources I've been reading, the externalization of an internal conflict. Something which properly belongs in the interior world is being externalized. I'll talk about this more tomorrow with the cartoons of Michael Lunig. Um, but I do feel that many of us have both a light side, a good, good side, a side which is oriented to spirit, and a darker side, which you know, is what we've traditionally referred to as sin, that word which is uh, so unpopular these days. And I, I'm not sure why, but it is and that there's an ongoing battle between our light and our darker sides. And this is just the nature of human life, this kind of battle. But if you have no sense of interiority, if you don't understand that the human person is a complex field where opposing forces battle each other, then we are more inclined to externalize this internal warfare and to declare a holy war in the, the larger world itself, in society writ large. Shahid Athar, 
uh, explains that in Sufi tradition, the ego is the enemy of spirit, and conquering the ego's ascendancy is the best form of jihad, allowing the Sufi to be at peace with himself and close to the Creator. And according to Islamicist Thomas Cheatham, who lives in Boston, terrorists have misunderstood the symbolic nature of their quest and the call for jihad, which runs all through the Quran actually, and are falsely externalizing this internal battle. Now I've been talking to some of you, um, I think we've, we've barely been talking for one day, haven't we? A day and a half, because the first three days of course were silent. Um, and some of you have been saying you've been trying to read the uh, Quran and you're finding it very violent. I think two, at least three of you I've spoken to about this. And I too have the, the, the Quran next to my bed and I'm trying to read it. It does seem very violent, but then again, if we uh, take it from the point of view of these uh, overheads, it may well be that the violence is symbolic. It's a symbolic war uh, between the, uh, the dark self and the light self within actually the, the soul of humanity. And that actually makes a lot of sense. Because um, at the moment everybody is saying worldwide, are the terrorists an expression of Islam or are they not an expression of Islam? And, and everybody's dividing on, on this issue. Um, and I'd like you to discuss this uh, in the discussion groups perhaps later today. Uh, Jung likened the religious impulse to an instinct and he said like every instinct it has its specific energy which it does not lose even if the conscious mind ignores it. This instinct would return like everything unconscious with considerable force as soon as conditions allow. It would not only return with explosive force, but it would return in distorted forms since psychic contents take on archaic or disruptive aspects when they are repressed. Again, as I said this morning, this is similar in a way to Freud's theory of the return of the repressed as sexuality. But Freud uh, was interested in sexuality, Jung was interested in spirituality and the return of the spiritual repressed. Jacques Derrida had an Italian colleague, Gianni Vatmo, and he said this, in spirit something that we had thought irrevocably forgotten is made present again. A dormant trace is reawakened, a wound reopened. The repressed returns and what we took to be an overcoming is no more than a long convalescence. I think this is a very important quote. The West, particularly the scientists of the West and the philosophers and the intelligentsia have all assumed, so I mentioned this morning, that the realm of the spirit has been put to bed. That, you know, that was a phase, a stage of humanity's growth. Then I read this magnificent statement in Monsieur Eliade's book, the sacred and the profane, and he said this, and I quote, the sacred is not a stage in the history of consciousness. The sacred is a element in the structure of consciousness. So it's not a stage in the history of consciousness, it's an element in the structure of consciousness. Now that's a really vital point and if we don't understand that, we, don't, we can't understand what's happening in the world today and what's happening in the future. So universities, as I said before, are getting very nervous because something that they thought was long gone is reawakening, but it's reawakening as a wound. The repressed returns and what we took to be an overcoming is no more than a long convalescence. So the intellectual enlightenment has put the realm of the spirit and soul to bed, to sleep, but like sleeping beauty, it was just waiting for the moment to wake up, to be kissed, kissed into awakening. And that is, seems to be what is happening at the moment. This is the, 
millennial nature of, of the present. Now, scientists thought Jung was mad when, in 1929, he announced the gods have become diseases. And that's why I, I published a book a couple of years ago called Gods and Diseases. Um, and that there would be hell to pay in psyche and society for the loss of religious life. But three generations later, Jacques Derrida, the most influential thinker in recent decades, felt that the return of the religious was welling up in the collective unconscious, as it were. Religion, said Derrida, is not something we do, but something that is done to us. That's one of his most famous phrases. And I like it very much. Religion is not something we do, but something that is done to us. In other words, something pre-existent, dare we call it God, is actually doing something to us. It arose from a mysterious source, which uh, we will have to explore with commitment, said Derrida. And sounding very much like Jung, Derrida said, quote, how can one account for this return of the religious without bringing into play some sort of logic of the unconscious. How can you account for the return of the religious without that? So today uh, we witness the rise of um, fundamentalism in all the major religions, especially in the three great monotheisms, Christianity, Judaism and Islam. But uh, fundamentalism is also felt in Hinduism and even now in Buddhism, which has been one of the most peaceable, peace-loving religions of all. We now live in a world in which religion and violence have been almost permanently associated, which is a shocking irony given that the scriptures of all these religions preach love, compassion and fellowship. But once the spirit is defiled, as I think it's been on a grand scale for the last three or four hundred years in terms of the history of the West, it emerges in distorted forms and nothing other than a general change of attitude will alter its destructive course. Fragments of sacred meaning are found in the degenerated religious forms of today and the perpetrators of terror, as you know, quote passages of scripture as they fly planes into buildings or attack railway stations, buses, hotels and most recently in France, media offices. This wrath seems to be not just of social or human origin, I would suggest, but perhaps has its source in something more archetypal, more basic. That is why the so-called war on terror can never eradicate this kind of violence because we are not only talking about human emissaries of evil, but we are talking about an eruption of evil in the world psyche itself. And here I, I as I said, I haven't uh, got overheads for this because I only got this in the uh, last couple of days. Some of you may not know because you've been very busy, of course, with this uh, retreat and, and now the seminar, that on Monday, Pope Francis uh, made a statement, uh, the State of the World Address, uh, which was uh, given to those diplomats and uh, uh, people involved with the, the Holy See in, uh, in Rome. And firstly, he condemned what he called deviant forms of religion and dubbed the, and I'm quoting here from Pope Francis, the never-ending spread of terrorist conflicts around the world, which is a third world war a true world war fought piecemeal. And um, you may not know because, as I said, we've been here in relative seclusion, but most of the big newspapers of the world are now referring to a third world war. Francis called for, quote, a unanimous response within the framework of international law to the so-called Islamic State and he urged all Muslims to, quote, condemn all fundamentalist and extremist interpretations of religion. And then he made a statement, which I, f I find very, uh, very helpful. He said, 
this, and I quote again, religious fundamentalism, even before it eliminates human beings by perpetuating gross acts of violence, eliminates God himself, turning God into a mere ideological pretext. You know, they're strong words. We haven't had a pope like this for ages. <laughs> I mean, the most, ex I mean, this is incredible. I mean, everything he says shocks and surprises. Um, in a positive way, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked and surprised positively. But let me just read that again. Religious fundamentalism, even before it eliminates human beings um, by perpetrating acts of violence, eliminates God, turning God into a mere ideological pretext. It's fantastic stuff. And I don't think we've seen such a, an extraordinary pope since probably John, uh, John the 23rd, yeah. in some ways. So that's what's happening at the moment in, in most of the, the newspapers as we are here in our, in our meeting. <clears throat> now I promised you this morning I'd say a bit about my own personal tussle with our church. I don't want to harp on this, um, but a lot of people have been asking me about it so I thought I might as well come clean. In fact, Vincent, is Vincent here? Yes, because you wrote an article on this. I did too, <laughs> You certainly did. And he sent it to me and he said, is this okay? <laughs> and I said, oh, thank you very much. And it was for the Anglican Times or something? Uh, it was an Anglican website, um, uh, Karma. Yeah. Sorry to wake you up uh, if you were asleep there. <laughs> I could see various people nodding off and I'd like to as well. Um, I want to say this, that, and, and a big question which I think we need to, especially those that from uh, the Catholic tradition, but from any Christian tradition, we were brought up, those of you who are my age and, and older, to believe that truth is singular, that there's an absolute expression of truth, one way. But if truth is plural, does that make our truth less true? This is a question I'm going to put up on the overhead because Vincent asked me to create some um, questions for the discussions. Is that going ahead, Vincent? Sorry? Discussion groups going ahead? Yes. So, okay. Yeah, if people want to get involved with that part of your presentation, they Okay. Can. I'm very much a child of Vatican II. I took Vatican II to heart and then, of course, by the time I'd really assimilated it, the church had moved on. <laughs> away from Vatican II and was sort of rapidly backpedalling toward Vatican I. Um, but a lot of us who took Vatican II seriously find ourselves adrift at the moment, really, and at odds with hierarchies. Now that's okay, um, but it's, it's a, a source of confusion. One of the achievements of the secular world, an achievement we must not lose as we move toward a so-called post-secular world, is that in the secular world, people became aware of the diversity of philosophies and religions and were mostly respectful toward this diversity. Without the secular process, you could almost say, we might still be back in the past where aggressive churches, I remember the days where Protestants and Catholics were at each other. It was a terrible stage and there'd be street fights and school fights and things like that. All that seems to have disappeared, which is great. But as one of my students said, rather uh, disconcertingly, it's only disappeared because we don't care about it anymore. <laughs> we don't care about Protestant versus Catholic, said one of my students. I thought, oh gee, that's a, that's a film of diversity and tolerance just coming from apathy. Really. But without the secular world and its understanding of, of, of diversity, and uh, tolerance, we might still have church traditions fighting each other, each claiming to have an absolute uh, take or an absolute claim on ultimate truth. And ironically, although religions preach compassion and fellowship to others, 
it took the secular experiment to make this tolerance and uh, diversity a real e event in modern society. Those of you who follow uh, the Sea of Faith movement will know that Dom Cupid is big on this point from Emmanuel College at Cambridge. He's been arguing for years that the secular world is actually ahead of the religious world in terms of its understanding of tolerance, compassion and uh, plurality. But whether that's the case, I don't know, but it's probably the most important contribution that the secular has made to the religion or religions of the future. And without this respect for all, and this is the overhead, without tolerance of difference and acceptance of plurality, I think the future of civilization is doomed. And upon this platform, uh, we can build a new understanding of religious life in which there are many pathways to the divine and none of them can claim absolute priority or knock out the others. Now, conservatives call this relativism and dislike it. But I call it the hallmark of civilizing morality, this understanding of diversity. Now, it was on this point that I fell into hard times with the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, as outlined in the article by Vincent. And for a full description of this conflict, I just refer you to my essay, The Light of Faith in a Dark Time, in a book published in Melbourne uh, a year or two ago called New Life and the Rediscovering Faith, if you're interested in that particular scuffle. But I think it's a very important point. If there are many truths, does it make our truth less true? And my answer is no. Because the world is a very complex and mysterious place. And as I said to you last night, my first contact with another religion another real living and strong religion was in Central Australia with my contact with Aboriginal people. And then the idea that they were wrong and I was right is completely anathema to me. In fact, everything that fellow said, Owen, who I met and I talked about last night, seemed to be almost um, chiming in completely with Jesus' own words. And he was not a Christian. He was from the Aboriginal dreaming. Now secular derives from the Latin secularis, meaning to make worldly. In its original usage, it didn't apply hostility to God, but merely a departure from ecclesial authority. And it was best understood not as anti-religious or atheistic, but as religiously neutral. So we might distinguish between secular and secularism. I talked about that uh, this morning. Now I want to move on to a more positive theme that the return of the sacred might bring grace rather than violence and apocalypse. The Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam are not against the world. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. That's in all three of those uh, religious traditions, their Bible. It's in the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible, and the Quran. And the idea that God and world are opposed, that the sacred is somehow otherworldly and this world is profane, strikes me as an aberration. It's not really part of the spirit of the, of the Abrahamic traditions. So secularization in the sense of making worldly is in my view not opposed to religious sensibility. Indeed, Charles Taylor's uh, theory in his book, A Secular Age, is that the secular is itself a product of Christianity. It's not the cancelling out of Christianity, it's what Christianity's always been moving toward anyway, from day one. And it's worth having a look at that book for that astonishing thesis. We might have supposed dualisms where there were none now, William Blake famously wrote in uh, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, eternity is in love with the productions of time. In all the mystical traditions, we read that the eternal is flooding into creation and wanting to participate in it, fructifying its life. 
One of the greatest exponents, of course, of this new holistic, non-dualistic vision is Teilhard de Chardin, who wrote of the increasing sense of beholding in creation. For him, evolution is an expression of incarnation. And this old-fashioned idea that science and religion are somehow opposed um, you know, is, is just nonsense when you read the work of Chardin and other uh, writers of, of his uh, kind. In numerous contemporary fields of thought, including eco-theology, the natural sciences, emergence theory and biology, and the study of consciousness, spirit is seen as coming from within creation not being imposed on matter from above, as in the medieval notion that you know, heaven is above. The idea that heaven is above, of course, is a metaphor. It's a metaphor of what is above the normal realm of perception. It's above metaphorically. It's not above literally. I fly a lot in the plane uh, from place to place, and when I was flying, recently from Melbourne to Alice Springs, I was sitting three, three seats and there's a woman next to me and her daughter was on the window and she was going like this, craning her head out the window of the plane and she said to her mother, uh, I can't see it. The mother said, what? And she said, I can't see heaven. <laughs> and I then thought, now what's the mother going to say to this, you know? And uh, she, the mother said, oh, no, darling, it's way higher than this. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, dear, <laughs> it's way higher than this. Yeah. What I would have liked to have said, if I could have put it on my professor hat for a minute to, to the people in the plane, is, I'm sorry, madam, but the idea of heaven as above is a metaphor as my friend uh, in San Francisco, uh, Alan Jones, who used to be the Dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, says, he, he has a line that he often says to his congregations, it doesn't sound very polite, but it's a metaphor, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought of publishing a book with that title, but then uh, that's really pushing it too far. <laughs> I decided that, that I, I wouldn't do that. But um, heaven, as it says here, I've got here, it's not a distant place, but the abode of a spirit that infuses all creation. As uh, Elizabeth, um, uh, what's her name, says? Hmm? Brown. Yes. Earth is crammed with heaven. It's a beautiful title. Earth is crammed with heaven. Yeah. So instead of seeing the secular world as a movement opposed to religion, Harvey Cox, for instance, sees it as a movement within Christianity itself, taking his cues, of course, from Charles Taylor. It's a movement, he says, in which the incarnational thrust of the divine is carried a step further. He says, Christianity has entered into its most momentous transformation since its transition in the fourth century into the religious ideology of the Roman Empire. Now, my words are, that's a big call, but he expands it in his book, The Future of Faith. He says, the future of faith is to be found in a new awareness of humanity's relationship with the world. Now, I've been mentioning him all this week, Charles Taylor, a philosopher who was leader of the John Main Seminar in 1988. Uh, could see a time when there would be a secular friendly religion and I'm hoping that uh, the Christianity can become that. If today's citizens are engaged in a secular spirituality, it has not come out of the blue, according to Taylor, but has a long background. And he says this, quote, the sanctification of ordinary life, which has had a tremendous formative effect on our civilization, spilling beyond the original religious variant into a myriad secular forms. It has two facets. It promotes ordinary life as a site for the highest forms of religious life, and it also has an anti-elitist thrust. It takes down those allegedly higher modes of existence, whether in the church or the world. The mighty are cast down from their seats, he's of course quoting scripture here, and the humble and meek are exalted 
So that's a very interesting twist here, that the secular world, uh, the increasing presence of spirituality, often uh, not necessarily religious spirituality, could in fact be the fulfillment in some way of the, the Christian vision. The irony is that the sanctification of ordinary life leads to the loss of didactic expressions of religion. Now, I was recently rereading the book of Revelation. Now, I know that's a dangerous thing to do <laughs> because it's a very odd book and sometimes I start it and don't finish it and I start seeing everything in seven. There were seven this, seven that, seven this because he's writing, of course, to the seven churches, uh, John of Patmos, if we assume he is the author of that, that book. And I was astonished to find that in the New Jerusalem there were no churches uh, John of Patmos felt that if and when everything was holy and there would, be, there would be no need to build holy dwellings because everything is holy. Things were already infused with the holy and it made me look upon the world today with new eyes, less mournful and more hopeful. Now I'm not suggesting we are heading into a new Jerusalem because you know, there's increasing violence and danger constantly and the Pope's warning that we're really in beginnings of World War III, which is now a terrorist war, fought, as he says, piecemeal around the globe. But I'm saying that we might think again about the so-called ordinary world. As uh, Cox put it, the historical process is making the borders between the religious, the spiritual and the secular more permeable. That's, I think, a lovely way of putting it. And permeability is one of Charles Taylor's uh, favourite phrases. He talks about the permeability of consciousness, especially in indigenous cultures. Now, I'm, I'm going to uh, finish this early today. Um, there's a, an Australian poet, Les Murray. He's, he's a Catholic poet, actually. And um, he writes a great deal about the life of the spirit. And he, he refers to it in this way. He says that um, the divine presence is hidden to ordinary awareness. He says, almost beneath notice, as attainable as gravity, it is a continuous recovering moment. Pity the high madness that misses it continually. Isn't that lovely? So that there's the presence of the divine is always there as a possibility but the high madness of our busy lives and our busy minds, which of course we encounter every time we attempt to meditate, getting rid of the noise of the mind is, is a big problem for me in meditation. Um, but there's a sense of it's attainable as gravity. Perhaps we try too hard to uh, achieve this state. And I'll give this same poet the last word, which is uh, like an anthem of post-secular religious awareness. What we have received is the ordinary male of the other world, wholly common, not postmarked divine. <laughs> That's lovely, isn't it? I've got that up on the wall in my study. I'll read it again. What we have received is the ordinary male of the other world, wholly common, not postmarked divine. So that in today's world, particularly the, the Western worlds, like you know, Western Europe, Australia, North America, New Zealand, um, if we're looking for things that shout religiousness, we will miss the religious, as it were. This is the paradox. The divine might be in the, in the common, in the ordinary, and not postmarked divine. So in that sense, I think we can look forward to the return of the sacred as it's not really a return, it's seeing what was already there, but we are seeing it with new eyes. Thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you. <laughs>